So if you ever have ever tried mixing oil and vinegar to create a salad dressing, you know that they don't mix very well. We would say that those liquids are immiscible, so they don't mix. Miscibility means to mix, and then adding the IM prefix means that they don't mix very well. So that's the definition of immiscibility. Exolution is if we were to force them to mix in some way, let's say we raise them to very, very high temperatures so we could dissolve the oil and the vinegar into one another, then once we would cool that mixture down, they would exsolve. So exsolve would be the verb form, and that means to unmix. And so we're going to look at some geological examples. By the way, if you are a bit of a uh, home cook, you might know that you can add mustard or something like egg yolk or lecithin. These things are emulsifiers, and they give the impression of mixing, but you're not really creating a mixture. The mu mustard uh, and lecithin and egg yolk uh, materials contain chains of CH2 and CH3 molecules that have a charged particle at the end or a charged uh, molecular uh, uh, portion to it, to it, usually a phosphate uh, atom. And that is something that can uh, surround an oil molecule, the CH3s can, and CH2s can dissolve into an oil, and then the, the charged phosphorus can attract the vinegar or the water or whatever other component you're adding. So we don't want to confuse emulsions with mixtures. Uh, but there is a cooking tip there. If you want to mix your oil and vinegar and have it look like a mixture, it won't truly be miscible, but if you add a little bit of mustard, then they should uh, emulsify quite nicely and have the appearance of being mixed, even though they are not. All right, so let's get back to the geologic example. Orthoclase can be thought of as our oil and all by it as our vinegar. At very, very high temperatures, they will mix completely. Let's use this diagram from Dexter Perkins' online mineralogy textbook. We'll go through his example where X marks the spot of our initial bulk composition, which he shows here is all by 60, orthoclase 40. If we have that system at very high temperature, above 900 degrees, the way he's shown it here, then we would have a single feldspar. So that we'd have a single grain here, and it would all be just one homogenized composition with the potassium and sodium atoms completely ran, or, well, I, I don't know, it doesn't necessarily have to be randomly, but quasi-randomly scattered about that structure. But once that material cools to a temperature of 730 degrees centigrade, then those potassium and orth, uh, uh, sodium atoms are going to separate, and we will have a separation into an all-bite-rich composition and an orthoclase rich composition. So at 700 degrees here, we would have an all bite composition that is somewhere around here. I haven't drawn it perfectly vertical. You get a ruler and do this a little bit better at home, and then you'd have an orthoclase composition would fall over here somewhere. Notice that if we go to lower temperatures still, let's say 600 degrees, the orthoclase rich component becomes even more orthoclase rich. So this would migrate out over here, and then this guy over here would become even more all by rich. Let's see if we can draw a little bit better of a vertical line. And so we get an even stronger separation. So notice that due to the shape of this curve, that curve would be referred to as a solvus. Then due to the shape of that curve, uh, we can see that the lower the temperature, then the greater this miscibility gap, the way it's been termed here. The greater the degree of chemical separation between the potassium-rich and the sodium-rich components in the uh, orthoclase, or excuse me, the uh, alkali feldspar structure. And we can see an example of that over here to the right. This is a photograph also in the Dexter Perkins online mineralogy textbook. Uh, this perthite structure shows this kind of X solution between uh, white areas that are probably all bite rich, and then these pinkish or orangish colors that are probably the components that are more potassium or orthoclase rich. So we get that separation, and we can measure those compositions. We can uh, put a microprobe beam on that white part, and then another uh, beam on that orange part and measure the degree of the separation. So if we get a separation that looks something like this, let's say we measure a composition where we have 
an orthoclase rich component that is about that composition there, and an albite composition that looks like it sits over here, and we'd be able to infer that the temperature would be something close to or slightly above 500 degrees the way I've drawn it. So the perthite compositions end up making a very good thermometer. We can fit, calibrate this curve through experiments and get a thermometer that is based on the composition, essentially the width of that solvus. Uh, one other term that's not shown here, the very top of this curve, the highest temperature that you can have along the solvus would be referred to as the con solute point. So let's write that over here, con solute point. And all that means, uh, con means with, solute means to d dissolve or create a solution. Above the con solute point, that would be the temperature above which uh, no matter what bulk composition you would have, uh, you would have a single feldspar composition. There would be no separation into uh, orthoclase or albite rich components. You would have a single feldspar over here. Anywhere in this pink area, we would have a single feldspar, whereas down here, we would have two feldspars. And those two feldspars would often have uh, textural characteristics of a perthite. So that's an example of exolution and immiscibility. We'll take a look at other examples relating to feldspars, again involving orthoclase and albite immiscibility, and then another example where we take a look at pyroxenes, where diopside and encetite components also show this kind of immiscibility and exolution at low temperature.